a best-selling author of over 50 books, Greg Reed. Hi, everybody. I had a great mentor. His name is Charlie Tremendous Jones, and he had a quote. He says that you are the same today as you'll be in five years, except for two things. The people you meet and the books you read. It's who you hang out with. It's what you put in your head that determines your character as a person. And the time we're going to have together, I'm going to tap a little bit of both. By the way, this is my big best-selling book called Three Feet from Gold. When I'm done, someone can take it. If you'd like it, I'm not selling it because they didn't sell so good. So here's the deal. <laughs> Three Feet from Gold is a story about a guy named R.U. Darby. He gets gold fever, but he knows nothing about gold. He goes out west and starts digging, and sure enough, he has a little discovery. He gets excited, so he hides it and buries it. He goes home and tells his family and friends, and they chip in money to buy equipment to pull it out by the truckload. Sure enough, the first ore cart comes out, and it's filled with gold. Woohoo! But then the gold ran out. They kept digging, but there was no more gold. Defeated, Darby walks out of the mine and says, I quit. I'm done, and sees a junk man walking by. He goes, hey, buddy, give me 200 bucks. I'm going to sell you this mine, all the equipment. I'm going back home to Maryland. Well, the junk man, looking at the equipment, realizing it was worth thousands, said, of course, you got yourself a deal. Darby goes home defeated. But the junk man goes to an engineer and says, what happened? This cat hit gold and ran out. The engineer starts laughing. He goes, that's mining 101. Everyone knows that gold runs in a straight line. It's called a gold vein. What Darby did is he came in one side, hit the gold, and popped back into dirt. He said, go back to where they discovered treasure, Go 90 degrees, just three feet the opposite direction, and you'll tap back into the vein. Not only did the junk man pull millions upon millions of dollars out, but that still fills Fort Knox today. And the moral is, how many times have we or someone we know quit one class short from a degree or sales or marketing or taking that step, taking action with that great idea? Now, along the discovery, I had an opportunity to interview a very amazing man. His name is John Schwartz, who invented super string theory. Now, this gentleman is a very amazing individual because for 10 years, everyone said he was crazy. They said if Albert Einstein couldn't figure out string theory, what makes some college professor think he could? For 10 years, he was a laughingstock in his own society, his friends, families, his peers, until finally a decade goes by and Dr. Michael Green and him get together and prove that their theory is the most accurate and John Schwartz becomes the father of what we know as string theory. And I said, why would you not quit? Why wouldn't you give up for 10 years when everyone said you were wrong? He looked at me and said, that's easy. I knew I was right. He said, never let another person or yourself talk you out of what you know to be true. And he gave me the greatest little tidbit I've ever had. He said, successful people seek counsel where failures listen to opinion. I said, what's the difference? He goes, counsel is based on wisdom, knowledge, mentorship. People have already paved the way where opinion is based on ignorance, lack of knowledge, inexperience. Like people may have never have done what you're about to venture upon. Let's say you go to someone and say, I'm going to write a book. Well, your family friend who's never done it before might tell you all the reasons you'll fail. If you go to Mark Victor Hansen, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, he's going to say, hey, before you get started, here's what you need to know and give you counsel based on wisdom, knowledge, and mentorship. John Short said, if we would spend our activities only seeking counsel and ignoring people's opinion, that's the day your life would change. And out of all the interviews I've done around the world, one of my favorite one rings true. It's from a, a poet, a philosopher, Evander Holyfield. You know the boxing guy? I didn't see it either. I went to him and said, Evander, how in the world did you win more heavyweight championships than anyone? He said, that's easy. I have a higher standard. He goes, if you have a car and you won't tolerate it running bad, being dirty, you have a higher standard in a nicer car than your neighbor. In sports, I showed up early. I left late. I invented exercises. I had a higher standard, and I won more championships than anyone. I said, but didn't it hurt being in a fight? He goes, God, yeah. But when you're in a fight, you don't focus on the pain. You don't focus on the blows. 
As soon as you focus on the pain, you end up on your back knocked out. But that's what people do outside the ring. They focus on gas prices, war, economy, and they wonder why they never become a champion. And he pulled me in tight. This Adonis of a man missing half a year, bitten off by Tyson, right? He says, you know what the funny thing is? He says, when you do win the championship, he says, everyone comes to their feet and they chant your name. They raise your hand in victory. And the guy puts a big, shiny belt around your waist. And at that moment, and at that second, you don't feel even one of the punches you took along the journey. But the guy in the losing locker room will have every excuse and feel every bruise for the rest of their life, wishing they had a higher standard. So look, I don't know every person in this room, but I do know this about you. You are the person that everyone around you comes to for counsel. You are the person that everyone else thinks got it all together, but you're like that pretty shiny duck on the water. Or on top, you look fantastic. Underneath, you're swimming like the rest of us. But the realities are, you've also been putting yourself last. You know, we always take care of our peers, our friends, our family, our coworkers, and we say, we're going to wait until it's my time. It's called a bad case of the one size. That means I'm going to take action once I get the big break, once I get the kids out of the house. But the best time to take action is the moment that it strikes you. So right now, I'm going to give you an opportunity, a challenge, so to speak, to draw a line in the sand and you step across and you say, it's my turn. For years, I've been watching other people not as smart as me have more success. That day ends today. You draw a line in the sand and you say, it's my turn. I've got the idea for that next play, that book, The American Spirit. I will not take it to my grave. Right now, someone in the seat is thinking, I've got something so special, but you're afraid to share it with what other people think. Remember that coffee mug at Disneyland that says, what would you do if you could not fail? Forget about it. What would you do if you didn't care what someone else might think? You draw a line in the sand and you step across and you say, it is my turn. You've got greatness inside of you. The fact is, someone in this room right now is thinking to themselves, that person is me. I invite you to draw a line in the sand. You step across and you step into your greatness and say, it is my turn. And when you want to say die and throw in the towel, that's when you kick it in the most. You could literally be just three feet from gold.